All right, so we're going to end the day by talking about the development from reflexes to action. So kind of looking at the organization of behavior in young infants. So um, with that being said, we'll start by talking about reflexes. So I have some fun gifts here for you, but um, newborns are equipped with a variety of reflexes. And these are defined as automatic or involuntary responses to certain types of stimulation. Uh, so some reflexes will remain throughout the lifetime. One example is eye blinking. Uh, we, we still engage in eye blinking, right, as adults, it protects against bright light or foreign objects. But a lot of reflexes are adaptive to infancy alone, but they disappear over time. So we're going to talk about some of these reflexes we see in young infants. So one is rooting. So this one is when a baby is touched on the cheek or brushed on the cheek they'll turn their head in the direction of that touch and they'll open their mouth. This reflex typically disappears about three to six months of age. And a similar one is sucking. So baby sucks when something is put into or right next to their mouth. And this disappears when it's replaced by voluntary sucking later on. So both of these, I said they're related because they are both components of nursing, as you might've guessed. Uh, they aren't very well developed at first. In fact, newborns are pretty disorganized with doing these at first with uh, nursing. Uh, they'll root for the nipple in a disorganized way. They aren't good at integrating, sucking, swallowing, breathing, all these things you have to do during feeding. Um, but once they reach about six weeks of age, they actually become more coordinated and feeding behaviors transform into what we call nursing. It becomes much more coordinated and organized. So we have a moro reflex over here, um, not so much related to these, but it's kind of its own thing. So the moro reflex, as the little image uh, shows, is they are arching their back and throwing their arms outward. And this is in response to a loud noise or a sudden sensation of dropping or falling. They'll kind of do this thing where they arch their back and throw their arms out. Um, so this is a defensive movement that disappears around six to seven months, so a little later. And it's a sign of normal neurological development if they're doing this. Uh, the function is not entirely clear though of why they do this. Uh, some believe that it served a function in earlier evolutionary stages to allow the infant to cling to their mother in threatening situations. Uh, others believe it's a function to promote bonding with mother and child. So those are the first three reflexes. Our last three involuntary reflexes at birth are first, grasping. So this is one we have maybe seen before. Uh, this is when a finger or an object is placed in the baby's palm. They'll close their fingers around it as a reflex. This is another sign of normal neurological development and it typically disappears around three to four months of age uh, when it is replaced by voluntary grasping. We'll talk about it in a bit. We also have the Babinski reflex. This is similar to grasping, but it's with the feet. Um, so when the bottom of the foot is stroked, baby's toes will fan out first, and then they'll curl around the finger or the object that stroked it. Disappears around eight to 12 months. And lastly, we have the stepping reflex. So um, as you can see, what they're doing is it resembles almost resembles walking, right? They're stepping. Um, so when they're held upright over a flat surface, uh, where their feet are on a flat surface, the baby will make rhythmic leg, leg movements that resemble walking. However, this disappears very early, around two to three months, and it doesn't uh, come back until they engage in voluntary walking, usually around one year of age. Uh, so some believe that it's just a reflexive kicking movement. Others argue that uh, it's an early component of walking. And those who do say that, they argue that the baby's growing muscle mass and weight eventually make this stepping difficult, which is why it disappears around two to three months. And then it reemerges when they start voluntarily walking. And to support this view, uh, some researchers have found that older babies will exhibit the stepping reflex if they are submerged in water, like the image here. Uh, so 
the idea is that the support of the, the buoyancy of the water aids in maintaining the stepping movement. The reason they can't do it past two to three months normally is because, um, again, the weight, they're growing weight and mass. Uh, that's just a theory, but take it how you want. Uh, think about what your theory is. Do you think it's a component of walking or is it just a random kicking reflex that goes away? So that leads us to developing action, specifically reaching and grasping. So we just covered early involuntary reflexes, but we also learned that they disappear over time. So when they do disappear, we also have coordinated intentional actions appearing. One example is uh, early reaching, <laughs> reaching and grasping. This is the, one of the first intentional actions we'll see of babies. Uh, we can think of it in segments, you know, it takes some time to get to actual successful reaching and grasping. So first we have pre-reaching. This is when they're reaching, um, very young infants are reaching toward objects. They clearly have an intention, but they can't really grasp or even accurately aim their hands toward it. This is due to lack of coordination. Uh, research has shown that um, if large colorful objects move slowly past an infant, like a ball of yarn, very young infants will reach toward it. And that's how we kind of, you know, one of the ways that we determine this pre-reaching as an early component of reaching. We also have visually guided reaching. So this is when there's more maturity in visual and motor uh, development. And this allows infants to reach and actually get their hands closer to the objects. They're becoming more coordinated. This is around three months, we'll see this happening. So there's an interesting study where um, they used Velcro covered mittens and put them on little baby's hands uh, about three months old. And uh, they put Velcro objects in their reach. So they could successfully connect their mittens to the objects and kind of uh, supported form of grasping. And then the control group did not have these mittens. They just did old fashioned reaching and grasping. The results showed that the mitten group showed greater interest in the objects and greater skill in grasping the objects when they were later tested without the mittens. So this shows that infants reaching and grasping can be accelerated if they are given support. So that's one of the first things we'll see in terms of um, voluntary action, moving away from those involuntary reflexes. Now, going back to Piaget, we learned about him a bit at the beginning, uh, but his first stage in his theory is a sensory motor period, which is during infancy. And what is going on during this period is babies and toddlers, they're coordinating their senses and their motor abilities, sensory motor, to gain knowledge about the world. And there's six substages, and the first two of them actually fall within this age range that we're talking about today, the three-month period. So we'll talk about the first two substages now. Um, so uh, first one is exercising reflexive schemas. This is from about birth until about one month. And what's happening is they're learning to coordinate reflexes present at birth, the ones we just talked about. Uh, so it's providing kind of this initial connection with the environment, but it doesn't add too much to development. It's more about just exercising their natural inborn reflexes that they're born with. Then we get to the primary circular reaction stage, the second stage, and this is from one to four months. So this is when new forms of behavior emerge and um, existing reflexes are being extended in time. So for example, sucking, sucking reflex will no longer be limited to just feeding. They'll start doing it between feedings and experimenting that way. Existing reflexes are also extended to new objects. For example, infants might start sucking their own thumb. Notice their thumb, hey, what's this? Start sucking on it. Um, so they're extending those reflexes in other ways. Um, so they're repeating pleasurable actions toward themselves. And if we break down, um, you know, the name primary circular reactions, you can think of primary meaning directed toward their own body themselves, their primary, and then circular meaning the behaviors circle back and they're repeated. So that, that's a very brief intro to Piaget's theory, but we will definitely come back to him later. 
Oh, learning theories. What are some learning theories out there to explain the development of action in infants? Um, so they're saying that new forms of behavioral organization emerge as a consequence of learning. We'll talk about two different theories here, or two different uh, views. So uh, classical conditioning is our first one. We may have heard of this. This is when existing behaviors come to be associated with new stimuli. This was first demonstrated by Pavlov, his famous dog experiment where the dog would hear a tone before food was placed in the mouth and they would start salivating in response to the tone before it received food. A dog learned to expect food. Um, so let's watch a silly clip from the office to demonstrate this as well. I have to reboot again. Hey Dwight, do you want an Altoid? What do you think? Dwight, one Altoid. Okay. Altoid? Sure. What are you doing? I... What? I don't know. I... Well, my mouth tastes so bad all of a sudden. Okay, maybe there's some Office fans who already know that scene, but that was a really good, actually, it was silly, but a really good uh, demonstration of classical conditioning. You know, he learned to associate the sound with getting an Altoid, and it's similar to Pavlov's original experiment. Um, how would this be applied with infants? Well, we've, uh, we've seen a similar experiment with a 14-month-old infant where at the sight of a glass of milk, the baby would open their mouth and make sucking motions naturally. And uh, they started sounding a bell on several occasions just before the glass of milk was presented. The baby began opening their mouth and sucking at the sound of the bell, even if the glass of milk was not there. So this is classical conditioning. It's building expectations through the process of association, building connections. Um, so this indicates learning. So that is one view um, or one method. We also have operant conditioning. So how do behaviors come into being? So this is saying that behaviors are shaped by consequences. Uh, so behaviors that lead to rewards will be repeated and behaviors that don't produce rewards or they lead to punishment will be given up on. So um, this has been tested many times with many reinforcers with um, you know, infants and kids like milk, sweets, pacifiers, et cetera. Um, there is a very famous uh, experiment where you uh, a ribbon is tied around an infant's ankle and it's connected to a mobile hanging above their crib. And the infant learns that kicking animates the mobile because it's tied to their ankle, right? And this, uh, like it would shape, the shapes on it would shake and spin and be an interesting visual effect, right? Which is a positive reinforcer. The infant enjoys this. So they start organizing their kicking behavior to produce more of these reinforcements. So let's watch a short video of a child, um, a home video from looks like the 90s, where uh, two parents actually seem to do this experiment on their kids. So it's only about two minutes. So let's see this in action. We're experimenting to see if Jeffrey knows whether he can control the world or not. And so this is a control situation and we have a string tied to his mobile stand and his foot so that when he kicks he can move the mobile stand but of course since it's just an empty stand with no mobile he doesn't get much of a, much of an interesting result and here we have the baby having no interest at all in his foot instead he's playing with his mobile which is correct <laughs> which has not been kept far enough away from him to properly control <laughs> so notice anyway, there's no foot action no foot action whatsoever zero kicks per minute so we don't want him to chew on his mobile. And now he's going to start chewing on the mobile. We better stop him, okay? Okay, and now as you see, we have the mobile back on the stand. So by kicking, Mr. Jeffrey Levin can make that mobile move. And hopefully, that should make him more interested in kicking. But as you see, he hasn't looked at his mobile even once because he outgrew his mobile a long time ago. There he goes. And he is kicking now two times per minute. There we go. Let's see. Let's see you move that mobile, Mr. Levin. Is that fun? Are you getting into that? Boy, is that fun. Boy, is that fun. Moving that mobile with your foot. My goodness. He 
Look at what you can do, Mr. Lemon. My gosh. That's amazing. That requires. All right, it goes on for a couple more minutes, but little Jeffrey does keep kicking and seems to realize that his foot is tied to it. He's the one causing the effect on that mobile. So it became a positive reinforcer. Um, and you can see his behaviors were shaped by the consequences. This is an example of operant conditioning. So that concludes this discussion on the transformation from reflexes to action. Um, so next time we will pick up on sensory capacities in these young infants and a few other topics as well. So thank you for joining everyone and I will see you next time.